Joining me now to discuss, Democratic Senator from the state of Massachusetts, Elizabeth Warren. Senator, always good to see you. I want to start with this new counter proposal from Republicans, $928 billion. bucks. Could you get on board for that? Well, look, I don't really think this is a serious counteroffer. First of all, they don't have pay force for this. It's not real. They have this illusory notion of how we're going to take money that's already been committed to other places and other spending. Second part is I'm not hearing about the green infrastructure, about the importance of when we make these investments that we're talking about moving our buses to electric, our school buses to electric, our mass transit to electric, so that we're bringing down our carbon footprint and whether or not they put enough money in to do this. But the third one is notice who gets left behind, the women. Infrastructure is about helping people get to work and helping businesses thrive because they've got workers. We build roads and bridges to do that. We invest in broadband to do that. We need to invest in child care to do that. Millions of women are out of the workforce right now. And one out of four says the reason I can't get child care. We were in a crisis before the pandemic hit. It only got worse during the pandemic. This is our chance to expand our idea of what infrastructure means. Give women who want to work a real chance in the workplace. And can I do one more part to that? Sure. And that is, remember, this is called a jobs bill. It's infrastructure and jobs. So long as we're investing in roads and bridges and lots of concrete, about 90 percent of those jobs are going to be for men. And they're good jobs. And I support that. And I think that's great. But when we're talking about child care, those jobs are nearly all going to women. And those jobs today pay far too little. We have a chance to turn those into good paying professional jobs. So and we and include child care. Then we get well, mamas get a chance in the workforce and daddies and the women who are doing the work get a chance in the workforce. And child care was included in the American Rescue Plan back in March. Thirty nine billion yes. uh, shoring up the child care industry, improving the wages for people that work in that industry. And if you think about all that we've spent. Right. So there is another roughly four trillion in spending on the table. All of this money would go to very important things. But if you, sp if you put all of it together over the last year, the government will have spent, if this gets approved, $10 trillion. People need this money. But I have to ask you about oversight. I know it's something that's so important to you. I don't see it happening. There still isn't even a chairperson for the CARES Act Oversight Committee over a year ago. Does it not concern you that we are spending a whole lot of money and not many people are minding the store? You can imagine how I feel about this. Well, and I want to hear know, about it. <laughs> my first step into public service in this way was with the Congressional Oversight Panel watching the TARP spending and trying to keep some kind of reins on that. So what's and happening now? now? Because TARP was 10 so years ago. So much more money. And no, it does not have the same kind of oversight. And we're already seeing, oh, it turns out money went in to uh, vaccine production and had not enough oversight. And so it went to people, uh, to companies that were poorly prepared, companies that ended up not able to perform on their contracts. Who knows what we can't see? That's the point of oversight, is that you have people who are committed, who are dedicated, and who are watching that the money goes in the ways that Congress allocated it and that People are not self-dealing or wasting the money. So should and we not right hit now, pause? We just can't tell. So should we not hit pause on more spending and first check where all the money's gone? I just, besides you, I really don't hear anyone talking about it. You know, it's, for me, it's not about pause the spending. We need this in the economy and we need to move on all of the pieces we need to do, including on the infrastructure piece. But the point is we need to step up on the oversight. We need aggressive oversight, and that means we need people running that oversight, and it needs to start right now today. Here's what I really want to ask you about in terms of pay fors. Why mm -hmm. hasn't your super wealth tax proposal been mentioned, right? We can argue about whether or not $500,000 is a lot of money or a little money or high tax states. You have got a plan for the wealthiest, wealthiest Americans to be taxed more, and it doesn't seem to happen. We know that polls show the majority of voters, even Republicans, support this. So can you help us understand where's the resistance? I'm down with it. 
You know, I, and I love that you're down with it because, as you say, most of the American people are down with it, too. You remember what the wealth tax is? That is for fortunes above $50 million. So why isn't that it's happening? It's a two-cent tax. That's it. You know, I feel really frustrated about this one. A lot of people that I talk to, I keep talking this up. I try to talk about it on the Republican and Democratic side in the Senate and the House. And I've got a lot of partners in this, but not enough to move it forward. And, and here's the thing about it. By it, the, the 99 percent in America, most of America paid about 7.2 percent of their total wealth in taxes last year. That top one-tenth of one percent, the people who would be affected by the wealth tax, they paid 3.2 percent, less than half as much. A wealth tax, they'd still be getting a great deal. So to me, it's like we've got to get this breakthrough. We've got to persuade our elected representatives that it is time not just to focus on income, where the differences are big, but to focus on, on wealth, wealth, where the differences are enormous and where those big fortunes are out there now creating their own weather systems. They are growing themselves. It's time for a wealth tax. They're buying America. their own islands. I invite any lawmakers who see the other side of this argument to come on any day. I do want to ask you about uh, the hearing you participated in yesterday. I mean, you came after bank CEOs hard. I do it uh, myself often, but specifically J.P. Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon for the company profiting off of overdraft fees during the pandemic. I want to play part of that. The regulators recommended you offer that same kind of protection to your customers. And, and How much, in fact, did J.P. Morgan collect in overdraft fees from their customers in 2020? Do you know the number? I don't know the number in front of me. But well, we, I actually we, have upon, the number in front of me. Upon it's request, one point four six three billion dollars. You and your colleagues come in today to talk about how you stepped up and took care of customers during the pandemic. And it's a bunch of baloney. So I did my homework on this last night. And the thing is, they did waive fees. They waived fees for 3 million customers. It was $350 million. They set up a $30 billion racial equity fund. So they now have accounts that don't even have overdraft fees. We know they handled the PPP program. There's a lot of things to go after banks on. But in this, are they really the bad guys? If they feel like lawmakers are going to punch them no matter what, why would they play ball when they don't have to? So let's remember the context here. And that is, as we started into this pandemic, the Fed and the regulators said to those big banks, we're going to waive overdraft fees at the Fed for you. So they got a huge backup, as well as they got lots of other benefits during the pandemic in order to support them. And they recommended that they automatically pass that same kind of benefit along to the customers and waive overdraft fees. And the reason for that, who do you think gets caught in the overdraft fees? It is principally people of low income. It's disproportionately African-Americans, disproportionately Latinos. It's people who are struggling, people who have lost their jobs. So the regulators give a break to the banks and say, give that same break to your customers. And what did the banks do? Nope. They said, if you can figure out how to ask for it, we're going to give it a little tiny bit, but we're not going to automatically waive it the way that the Federal Reserve waived it for those big banks. So, so they me, did it it's for three million customers, but they didn't do it for everyone. Then why wouldn't the regulators and the Fed not recommend it? Why wouldn't they require it? I recommend that my kids brush their teeth, but <laughs> if I don't require it, I promise you they'd be at school right now with stinky breath. And that was exactly the point of my questions, is that we cannot give benefits to these giant financial institutions and hope that as a consequence, they're going to treat their customers better. What they're going to do is they're going to do a little bit and they're going to talk a lot about the good things they did. But ultimately, they boosted their own profits. J.P. Morgan made about twenty eight billion dollars last year. And a billion and a half of that came from people who were struggling with overdraft fees at the same moment that the Fed was waiving those overdraft fees for J.P. Morgan. That's not right.
I do want to ask you a little bit about compromise and bipartisanship before sure. we go. I know we had just said the Republican bill isn't enough. There should be a whole lot more. You want more in it. But right now, the Senate cannot agree on the January 6th commission, police reform, infrastructure, gun reform. What do you say to your constituents about government dysfunction? In your and my personal lives, we have to compromise on almost everything. Why doesn't Congress? You know, I don't see this just as Congress can't compromise. I see this as right now the Democrats are trying to get things passed that make sense, like a January 6th investigation or some sensible gun safety protections, things that are wildly popular all across this nation. And the Republican response has simply been no. They've just crossed their arms and said no. We're just not going to do that. It's hard to compromise with someone who's just saying no. It's not like there's some place you meet in the middle on that. So to me, this is about what President Biden did when he passed the, the cures, when we first were doing this, the rescue package. He said, if this is something that people want all across the nation, then I'm going to find a way to push it through. And I'm going to call that bipartisan because Republicans wanted it and Democrats wanted it across the nation. It's the Republican elected officials in Congress who are out of step with their own constituents, out of step with the people across this nation who want to see us make change. Well, Senator, the majority of the American people agree with you on an ultra wealth tax. I invite anyone on who disagrees. Senator, thank you for joining me this morning. I appreciate it. Thank you.